Despite budget setbacks, the Air Service continued to make aviation history with record-breaking flights. Lieutenant Kelly and McCready won congratulations from the Dean of All Flyers, Orville Wright, for setting several duration and distance records in the famous P-2, a hot ship. For the first non-stop coast-to-coast -coast flight, the Air Service modified a giant commercial transport with special tanks in the wings. This was the third try by the same men in the same plane. Two previous west-to-east hops had failed. In preparing the plane, 780 gallons of gas were pumped aboard. By flying from east to west, they hoped to use up most of the gas load before climbing the Rockies. This was not a stunt. John McCready and Oakley Kelly were part of a larger Army program to develop better planes, engines, and navigation, and to advance flying techniques. As the prop was spun, history took note of May 2nd, 1923, as a memorable day. One of the tensest moments was the takeoff. Would the monoplane, now weighing 10,000 pounds, clear the Curtis hangars at the far end of the field? It did. Throughout the 2,250-mile route, the pilots took turns at the controls. Average speed, 94 miles an hour. Less than 27 hours later, the T-2 arrived over Rockwell Field, San Diego. After spanning a continent, the huge plane and its two-man crew settled down to Earth. And the single Liberty engine now taxied the T-2 on California soil toward the excited crowd. By covering the greatest distance ever made in a single cross-country flight, Kelly and McCready proved that eventually, in a national emergency, troops could be transported from one coast to another in little more than a day. In the early 20s, chief proponent for the value of air power was Brigadier General Mitchell. Since his return from France, he had insisted that an airplane could sink any surface ship. And when he argued that one half the cost of a single new battle wagon could supply the planes to make the warship obsolete, Congress insisted he get the chance to prove it. For the test, Billy Mitchell hastily assembled a force, including some Navy flyers, which he trained at Langley Field, Virginia. He taught them the same bombing techniques which he had learned in World War I. Engines were started, and the first provisional air brigade took off for a mission which was to test the future of military aviation. Fast pursuit and heavy bombers accompanied by auxiliary planes with cameras and observers headed for the latest target, a U.S. battleship. By new tests conducted on the obsolete Alabama, Mitchell tried to clinch his claims. Through the use of phosphorus bombs, he demonstrated the fine art of precision bombing. Perfect hit. This was expert pinpoint bombing. Heavier bombs were now prepared by the armors of the Air Brigade, and the SS Shawmut radioed orders for the new takeoff. Power men signaled the heavy bombers, and again they displayed the same remarkable precision. But the Joint Board was still unconvinced even when more bombs finally sank the Alabama. Two years later, Billy Mitchell and his men prepared for a new series of battleship bombing tests, this time against the obsolete battle wagons, New Jersey and Virginia. On the deck of the San Mahil were General Pershing, Admiral Shoemaker, Assistant Secretary of War Davis, and the new Air Chief, General Patrick. The 1923 tests attracted even more widespread public and official attention. The target sat and waited for a 2,000-pound bomb to be dropped from 10,000 feet. The Air Service was learning that a near miss was the body blow that weakened the hull, setting up a target for the knockout punch. Mitchell's Air Brigade was becoming more and more expert and could lay those eggs anywhere. A photo 
photo plane recorded everything on film. The beginning of the end of a mighty warship victim of precision bombing. A direct bomb strike had cleared the decks and armor plate buckled like a tin can. By showing her keel, the Virginia proves she's had enough. And she's on her way to join the other test victims, German sub U-117, destroyer G-102, light cruiser Frankfurt, and battleship Ostfriesland, as well as U.S. battleships Alabama and New Jersey. Air power versus sea power. The tests were a brilliant success, even if many years were to go by before their significance was fully appreciated. For 10 years after the armistice, the job handed America's air service was a secondary one, support of the ground forces. Although later chapters in the Air Force story show the growth of the nation's air arm was inevitable, skeptics persisted in trying to stop progress. Thus, it was a slow and difficult climb to be allowed a more positive role in national defense and eventually to prove, like Billy Mitchell did, the power punch of strategic bombardment and the peace power of the United States Air Force.